But the problem is, is that what socialism succeeded in doing, to come back to that, is that in the in the 19th century, the socialists, and particularly in its in its mid 19th century Marxian form, from Karl Marx's writings, is that any failure that is that that you experience, any frustration and disappointment that 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 you go through, and any any uh, any not gaining of the of of the material status that you want and hope for or think is justly yours, it's not your fault. It's the system's fault. So I'd like to actually open up by reading you this tweet by a Zoomer. And I would like to hear your perspective on this. So she wrote, so many Zoomers are anti-capitalist because we were born into a state of capitalist decay. We don't remember the good old days where an average job could pay for rent and school. Most of us have only known debt, foreclosures, and multiple once in a lifetime economic crashes. Uh, okay, so um, what, what's, what's my response to that? For, first of all, uh, there, there's a pre premise in uh, the, that person's argument that uh, is not fully true. On the one hand, we obviously have a market economy. Uh, we go to the store, we buy goods and services on prices that are often, or if not mostly competitively set. Uh, there's private businesses, there's enterprises that are guided by the profit motive and so on. But the fact is we do not live in a free market society. Uh, the degree to which government regulates, controls, restricts, prohibits, subsidizes, commands uh, is far greater than most of us are aware of, uh, because most of it is sort of behind the curtain. As a consumer, you just go into the store and you see a product for sale and there's a price attached to it and so on. But behind that price is a production process where the manufacturers had rules, regulations, restrictions, requirements, uh, limitations on uh, what resources he could use, how he could use them in the production process, uh, the quantities and the prices of the goods he could import or export uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so what we have is a highly regulated and controlled market that is very far from the free market. And especially this uh, applies to the area which that person was especially drawing our attention. And that is, it seems that we've been in a period of crises, recession, uh, a, a an era, a post era when, when higher incomes were not assured and rising prosperity didn't seem to be the norm, mm -hmm. which they're basically speaking of as the period since the financial and housing crisis of 2008, 2009. Right. But what has not often been paid enough attention to, certainly not by the media, is that what was really behind these crises? The fact is, is that uh, which would take up an entire segment of such a talk uh, was the fact that we had a, a federal, we have a Federal Reserve System, a central bank, that manipulated interest rates, uh, distorted the relationships between savings in the economy and investments in the economy, that created these artificial uh, investment booms, of which the housing market was one, mm -hmm. and that uh, the government's distortion, or I should say the central bank's distortion of interest rates and investment patterns, set up the system for an imbalance that was eventually leading to a crash. Uh, and if I can just continue with that uh, yeah. in relation to the housing market, uh, the fact is, is that uh, we, have a situ we had a situation which basically continues in which uh, you have two government agencies called Fannie Mae and, and, and Freddie Mac. These are acronyms for government housing uh, subsidy and supporting agencies. One was established in the 1930s during the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal the other was uh, brought into existence during Lyndon Johnson's Great Society period in the late 1960s. Uh, but basically what, what they do is that they go to the financial markets that deal with mortgages, the housing market, and they have been saying to uh, lenders, you know what, don't worry about the credit worthiness uh, of a potential home buyer. Uh, he doesn't have the normal uh, down payment. Uh, he doesn't have a good work history or a cr good, reliable credit history. Don't worry. Uh, extend the loan to him, 
And if it were to go bad, to go into default or, or, or um, delays in, in, in mortgage payments, we, these government agencies, guarantee you the value of the loan. Oh, Mr. Banker, you're still nervous. Don't worry. You extend the loan and then immediately we'll buy the mortgage from you and just give you what you laid out for the home purchase to begin with. And then we, these government agencies, will hold the mortgage. The wow. upshot of it was that either through the ownership of these housing mortgages or guarantees backing the mortgages being held by these banks, the federal government was guaranteeing either directly or indirectly 50% of all of the houses in the home market in the United States. That is not a free market. It's a government controlled and dominated housing market. Wow. Now, why did they do this? Because to be honest, for a long time, there were politicians who saw political gains by saying, oh, it, it's the American dream that people have houses. And maybe mm -hmm. some groups are not properly represented in an opportunity to go into to having their own home. So we, the government, are going to assist them by setting up these guarantees and promises and supports, even if certain individuals do not meet the usual benchmarks of credit worthiness for the extension of a home loan. So basically, it was a totally politicized situation. And finally, the system collapsed. The financial markets went down. The housing market went, 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 went through the floor. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people had a hard time. Though I should mention here, um, yes, were there people who, because they lost their job and could not meet their mortgage payments, maybe had to sell the home that they had lived in and hoped to always live in, and maybe even suffered a loss. But it's worth keeping in mind that, that most of these were losses on paper. If a person could keep up their mortgage payments and could stay in the house for any other reason that otherwise would result in them needing or having or wanting to sell it, mm -hmm. uh, the housing market has now gone way up, far beyond what it was at the time of that earlier 08, 09 crash. So, so, so in fact, it, it, it affected those who unfortunately either had lost their job because of the general economic downturn or for other reasons had to sell their house when, when the prices had fallen dramatically. But right. the, the basis of all of this was the government's artificial stimulus to, to these uncreditworthy home loans. Now, again, if, if maybe some viewers or listeners recall at the time, the politicians uh, were raising their arms. Oh, these irresponsible bankers, they've created all these problems. Hmm. But I try to use an analogy. Uh, let us suppose that there is someone that you know uh, who has uh, a, a proneness to drink to excess and they're trying to get on the wagon. And you run into them in some restaurant and you offer to buy them a drink and then another drink and then another drink, and then another drink. And now they're inebriated. And in that inebriated state, they they go go out to the parking lot to drive home, and they end up in a wreck. And what, 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 what's the response that's often heard? That irresponsible driver. What, it's, it's shocking that, that he should go behind the wheel you know, in, uh, in that state and cause a crash. But who is feeding him the drinks? who, knowing his susceptibility of it, fed his weakness. Yes. Well, that is what these government loans, guarantees, and purchases of mortgages basically ended up doing. It's the fellow who's saying to the banker, don't worry about who, you, who you're extending a loan to, whether it's credit worthy, whether he has enough in, an, in a standard annual income to meet the, the, the monthly payments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they feed all of this excess and it goes busted, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. It's, it's like the famous scene, if some viewers have seen the classic movie Casablanca. Yes, I watched it last week. Prefect of police <laughs> in orders that Rick's Cafe be closed. Yes. And Rick says to the prefect of police, on what grounds are you doing this? And he says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I'm shocked to find out there's gambling going on here. And the croupier comes up to the prefect and says, you're winning, sir. I mean, yes. th th this is the absurdity of this. Okay, exactly. so and and then we also had a situation that uh, the following this crash, uh, the government uh, continued to intervene and, and and intrude itself in markets in various and sundry ways, but especially during the Obama administration, 
that just exacerbated it in such a degree that rather than a normal correction from a downturn, usually the patterns of, re, of booms and busts, uh, inflations and recessions, is, is that you know, a downturn may last a year and a half, two years at the most, but the economy recovers, returns to, quote, normal levels of production and employment. It took nearly a decade for the economy basically to dig itself out of this hole. And to a great extent, it's because of the, the, the government policies that were superimposed on this downturn to begin with. So I understand the, 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 the frustrations of that commentator, that tweet. But yeah. the fact is, is that uh, the failure to understand that government was behind a good deal of it means that it's not the, the failure of capitalism, but the failure of the interventionist and regulatory state. An interventionist and regulatory state has different names. It could be fascist. It could be socialist. You know, there's different names for it, right? But would you say that that means that, you know, the closer that you are to an interventionist state, that the closer you are to a, a socialism or something else like that? Yes. See, the, the, the problem that often arises is that we often think about, you know, socialist revolutions like, you know, a communist revolution where a minority of, of revolutionaries take over and rapidly transform and, ups and take over the society and, and impose mm -hmm. a, their, their uh, totalitarian system. Uh, but, but the fact is, is that there, there, there can be one that, that occurs like this in slow motion, in that the government intervenes and regulates here, and then the government intervenes and regulates there. And all of the interventions and regulations cumulatively create imbalances, distortions, uh, 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 unprofitable circumstances, such that then the government has to intervene again to try to compensate for the negative consequences and outcomes of its prior intervention. And then another layer of intervention and another layer of intervention. And each layer of intervention is reducing the degree to which the market is competitively open and free and not overlaid with this heavy handedness of government and politicized control and regulation until a point is reached. And, it's, and I'm not saying it's easy to say, say, you know, what is that point in which the system changes over from system A to system B? Yeah. But at some point, the degree to which the government has intruded itself into market and social affairs uh, is so weighty that you no longer have any meaningful free market and you basically have some form of a command or planned uh, economy. Now, as you're saying, it comes under many different names. It can be called socialist or communist or fascist, or as under the Nazi system, national socialist. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, all of them are merely variations on the theme of government taking over the primary paternalistic and political responsibility of directing, controlling, commanding, and determining uh, what gets produced, how it's produced, uh, to whom the output is distributed, and so forth. Until yeah. finally, you basically have no market economy left, but but, but basically a planned society from the top down. Well, now what we see as well, and one thing that I think uh, a reason that people still believe that it's the capitalist fault is because they see a lot of cronyism, right? Like they see that there are these mergers, these deals that are happening between governments, big corporations, or very, very powerful people who in some cases now, some organizations are more powerful than governments and have more of a sway on things. Yeah, you see, you see, one version of the command and controlled or a paternalistically guided economy is, is what in the 20th century uh, took its form uh, under the name of fascism. Um, fascism uh, was born, if you will put it that way, in Italy in the years immediately after the First World War with its leader and founder, Benito Mussolini. Uh, Benito Mussolini, before the First World War, had been one of the most prominent members of the Italian Socialist Party. In fact, he was the editor of the leading socialist newspaper in those pre-World War I years, uh, an Italian socialist newspaper called Avante. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the First World War, uh, he, he decided that, that he, Italy needed to be more nationalistic, uh, and less internationalist, as the other forms of Marxian socialism had focused upon in, in ideological principle. And uh, what he therefore advocated was another version of the planning and command society 
And that is you don't nationalize the means of production like the Marxists and most other socialists historically had called for. And the government directly owning and then controlling and planning what got produced, how, where, when, and for whom. Mm -hmm. Instead, most industry would be left in private hands, but the government would overlay it with planning agencies and authorities that would dictate the prices at which the goods were sold, the types and, and, and amounts of output that each firm and industry would manufacture and offer on the market, and to whom it could sell it and in what quantities, the wages and the work conditions under which people would be employed. So basically, it's, it's just another version of a planned economy as the traditional image of, of socialism with direct government ownership, but merely on paper, things remain in private hands, and the government has agencies that tell the private owners what to do. Now, there's a symbiotic relationship here, and, and that's a big element of what, what we have in the American economy uh, on, under our form of, of, of special interest politics, because certainly those who are being regulated or those who are receiving government expenditures for one purpose or another have a motive and incentive to participate in the political process to try to see that the subsidies, the government spending continue to go in their ways uh, to benefit themselves within the context of what the government is planning and attempting to do. For, for example, <clears throat> there's a big push you know, for, 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 for green alternatives to fossil fuels, solar, wind power. Well, wh who's going to be producing and supplying these things? Mm -hmm. There are solar panel manufacturers. They're, 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 they're the builders of the wind turbines and going on through all the other variations on this theme. They have strong incentives to lobby and push for more government involvement, more government spending, more government insistence that those forms of energy provision be provided instead of fossil fuels, because that's where the money is going to come to them. So you have sort of this interlocking interlocked uh, uh, connection b between the, the, uh, the, the political ideologues who want to transform the society into this green revolution, uh, the bureaucrats who make their living uh, being part of these structures imposing and determining and guiding and commanding, and the groups in the private sector who will be the beneficiaries of that expenditure largesse. Yeah. Uh, again, another example of this is the defense industry. Uh, supposedly, the Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union 30 years ago in 1991. But if one looks at the federal government's budget deficit, uh, budget de debt, excuse me, uh, and, and spending, it has continued to grow. Now, on average and in general, in, in recent years and now this coming year, defense spending by the federal government is going to be about $800 billion, not far from a trillion dollars. Hmm. Now, who receives all that money? Now, the fact is there are a handful of companies that are the contractors for, for U.S. military material, submarines, aircraft carriers, military planes of, and helicopters of various sort, tanks, other forms of armaments and ammunitions, drones. Each one of those private companies in this network has a strong incentive to lobby, to, to support an, uh, an interventionist foreign policy on the part of the United States, to see enemies everywhere against whom the United States has to be protecting themselves through maintained or increased defense expenditures. Now, this is not a free market. This mm -hmm. is not what, but what traditionally advocates of, of individual liberty, uh, free competitive capitalism, uh, rule of law and limited constitutional government have, have advocated or supported or called for. In fact, these are all forms of, of, of corrupted and crony uh, planned and, 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 and regulated e economic activities. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that is what we have. We are very far from either the historical form of a free economy or the ideal of a free economy. Right. Uh, we, we, we have basically the controlled and command economy with all of these different interest groups vying and fighting with each other for power and influence. And without, if I can just push this one more thing here, you saw the same thing in the Soviet Union. 
Yeah. In, in the following sense, you had the Communist Party that was a dictatorship, right? One party rule. And you had a central planning agency, which was called uh, by its acronym Ghost Plan. And then you had government owned all these different industries and sectors of the economy with the managers and the, and the supervisors, all d- implicitly employees of the government. But each of them had a, had a vested interest that, that as part of the central plan, more, more, more resources and more spending went in their direction, more promotions, more perks and privileges, more opportunities to be in the circle of power and influence. So all of these things occur under all systems in which the government makes itself partners in the economic affairs of the society. So that really destroys the argument that capitalism is to blame. And another thing that I've heard of uh, recently was that capitalism, I don't know if this is true or not, uh, was a derogatory term that was actually invented by Marxists. Have you anything to say about that? Yeah, uh, you know, it's very interesting is that uh, if, if you go back to the late 18th century, the late 1700s and the early 19th century, the early 1800s, uh, and, and you have these advocates of what today we call capitalism, Adam Smith, the famous Scottish uh, philosopher, yes. uh, uh, economists, British economists such as... Uh, as a David Ricardo or the French economist Jean Baptiste say, they never used the word capitalism. There was no such word as capitalism. They talked about the commercial society. They talked about the, the the market society, and they were the critics of the government regulations controls of their time. Mm-hmm. That is that which existed prior to the liberation of the market from government controls that were known in the in the 18th and early 19th century as mercantilism. Uh, the, the, the term capitalism race basically emerges out of the circles uh, of the socialists. And you're right. It was meant as a derogatory term that is a capitalist system because those who own privately the capital of the society control, exploit, manage and abuse others. So that's why it's called capitalism, that the, the owners of, of, of machineries and factories are the exploiters of the rest of society. And that's the capital owning capitalist society. So it is a derogatory term. Uh, yeah. But it's it's so stuck for various and sundry reasons that 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 I, I don't really think that 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 you could do much to to eliminate it to prevent the ambiguity and the confusions. Yeah. But uh, but if you understand that capitalism, rightly understood by its proponents over the last two hundred years, means a society of open uh, competitive uh, opportunity, uh, freedom of choice, and freedom of association. Uh, rights of an individual to their life, liberty, and honestly acquired property, uh, free exchange in which no one may be compelled or commanded to enter into a relationship, an association, or an exchange, not of their own choosing and agreement, then then th- that is what the ideal of capitalism is about. So I think that Ayn Rand also uh, really kind of had, you know, a pin on what was the philosophy behind the reason people hated capitalism or laissez-faire or free markets so much and competition, really. Why people hated competition was because inherently there are people who are better at doing things than others. And so people are not all equal in that sense. Like they're different, you know, they have they have uh, uh, different abilities, they have different capabilities. And so she thought, I guess, that envy was the root of socialism, you know, was was the root of that interventionism to say, well, we have to come in there and make it fair for everybody. And you're talking about this with the housing crash, right? Because that's pretty much what they did. They said, well, we're going to create this equality of outcomes. Everybody deserves the American dream. Everybody should have a house. Even the people who can't afford the house that they want should be able to get that house. And that's where you see that you have all this destruction that follows afterwards. But um, do you want to tell me what you think a little bit about the the envy that might be behind socialism? It's it's a long tradition. Ayn Rand emphasized it, but it but it's a theme that that was brought out by by defenders of the market economy and critics of socialism already in the nineteenth century. That 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 there are people who who are envious of others. Now, now, what is envy? It's a resentment that someone, not just that someone has something that you don't, uh, that you would like to have, but your resentment that since you don't have it, 
you wish them not to have it. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather everyone to be pulled down to the same low level than to have a system in which each individual has the latitude and the liberty to find their own level based upon their, admittedly, you know, inherited talents and abilities. You know, some of us are born tall to potentially be a basketball player. Others are born uh, short and potentially maybe a horse jockey and the rest of us somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's natural limits and, and uh, to, to our potentials in that sense. But there's also the fact that there, there's education, there's drive, there's ambition. Uh, there's also, let's face it, luck. Uh, yeah. And luck has been around long before capitalism. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but that this means that, that, that individuals may not be able to always achieve their goals and the ambitions that they hope for and thought that that could be theirs uh, because others could compete better themselves than, 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 than themselves. Uh, could come up with more successful ideas, be more industrious, more willing to make sacrifices in the present for gains in the future, right. or willing to save, to invest, to put off yes. income now to to uh, go to college and have a low income for a few more years, but to come out with the degree that puts you at a higher plane for your entry level job and, and starting salary. Right. Well, pe people are different, and and the fact that that this difference often creates these disappointments, frustrations, and and uh, sometimes envy. Right. The, the problem is not just that envy exists. If you look at historically, uh, and there's an excellent book called Envy by a German sociologist named Helmut Schock that came out in the 1960s. But he pointed out that uh, through the ages, people, you often find envious people, but it was considered impolite and bad form to show your envy. It's sort of like you're pointing out your own weaknesses because of your enviness of the other. Uh, if someone does better than you, like if he wins the race rather than you, you should be congratulating him. It's like the, the, the tennis game. Uh, one person loses on the court and the other wins win. And as frustrated as the loser is, you're supposed to be a good sport. Shake yes. the other's hand, congratulate yes. them. Uh, you know, well, the best man won, even if you're disappointed it wasn't you. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, so, so it was bad form to show your envy. But the problem is, is that what socialism succeeded in doing, to come back to that, is that in the, in the 19th century, the socialists, and particularly in its, in its mid-19th century Marxian form from Karl Marx's writings, is that any failure that, is, that, that you experience any frustration and disappointment that, that, that you go through, any, any, uh, any not gaining of the, of, of the material status that you want and hope for or think is justly yours, it's not your fault. It's the system's fault. The capitalist has, 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 has prevented you from rising uh. as high as you deserve. He has somehow exploited you, abused you, denied you the opportunity that should have been yours. He he lives in the in, in 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 the nice expensive house that in other circumstances you could or should have had, uh, and 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 that, that then that plays into modern democratic politics. I mean, what do politicians run on? Do, you know, how often do you hear a politician today, especially, say, but you know what, the government is spending too much, and it's an overreach with paternalism. And, you know, maybe you should be a bit more responsible. So we're going to cut the government co programs and reduce taxes. Yeah. And uh, you're now on your own more. No. Whether it, whether it be one party or another, whether it be one party or another, it's the opposite of that. Yeah. Is it not? Oh, I'm, you, you're suffering from some misfortune or disadvantage or discrimination or abuse that is no fault of your own. And we shall use government through regulation, through spending, through taxing in some way to give you what I know you really deserve and which others in the society have abusively denied you. Right. And it plays to, to the subtle and, and, and sort of subconscious envious urges in many people. Now, I, I do want to be fair. and I, I know I'm talking too much and I apologize. No, but, that's good. Uh, you know, it would be, many people have a sincere and deep 
concern and empathy for for the circumstances of others who are less well off than themselves, and sometimes very much less well off. Uh, a, a sincere honesty of wishing good for their fellow man. The question is, have the right means been chosen to that end? And I would argue that it can be argued that relying upon and falling back upon and seeing the growth of government interventions, regulations, redistributions, and political control of people's lives are at the end of the day, the wrong means to achieving a society that fosters both freedom and the prosperity for the very people who those have, who have these concerns would want to help. Yes. Well, that's a very good point. And I think that's why um, these kinds of interventionist programs appeal to people because they think, well, these are programs that will actually help people. I remember seeing something that Thomas Sowell was saying about how he was involved in a housing project, you know, and he was really a leftist um, and he was a socialist thinker, you know, at the beginning of his career. And he, he went kind of onto the site, I believe it was something like that. And he saw what was actually happening. And he said, well, this is just making everything worse. And that kind of sent him down the road of thinking about things more deeply and figuring out that it was the opposite outcomes. And once they, you see that kind of played out in different mm -hmm. jurisdictions. And for example, in Quebec, you have an extremely interventionist government there, and it's really kind of a welfare state. And yet, if you look at the people who are more socialist and they live in those circumstances for many decades now, they are actually the people who contribute the least to charity in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when people are, are really want to help and they have extra, they have excess, mm -hmm. then they're able to do so in the ways that make the most sense. Yeah. Uh, um... Let me maybe give one or two examples of well-intentioned policies that have uh, undesirable consequences from the perspective of the intervener himself. Mm -hmm. Minimum wage laws. Uh, some people are low-skilled, uh, high school dropouts, um, don't have uh, the necessary training, and therefore their entry-level jobs pay very little or hypothetically would pay very little. Well, surely we can help a person to have a fair wage, a living wage, by mandating a minimum hourly wage below which no one can be employed and any employer who attempted would be penalized by the government in some way. The problem is, is that you can't make someone more valuable than another thinks his services are worth. All of us know this commonsensically when we do our own shopping. You, you go into the, in, into the department store and you're looking through the clothing section. That's a nice jacket. This is a nice shirt. That's a nice pair of pants. Oh, but then you look at the price and you say either I can't afford it, given my budgetary constraints, or I could afford it, but it would require me to be spending so much on this item that the things I would have to give up instead that I wouldn't have the money to spend on it in another direction is more valuable to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't buy it. Yeah. Now, the businessman has no revenues from which to pay salaries to his workers other than the revenues he earns by selling a product to us, the consumers. So he has to make a judgment. What is it that consumers want? And given what I think I could produce and, and, and the quantities that I could manufacture, what price would they be willing to pay for it? And based upon that, he has to then ask himself, well, if that's what I think I could sell and the price at which I could sell it for, uh, what would it cost me to produce? I have to hot, uh, rent or buy land. I have to either rent or build a factory. I have to purchase or hire machinery. I have to hire workers uh, to, to be employed to participate in the production processes. Uh, so what can I afford? What are my costs relative to the revenues I think I could earn? And he has to ask himself uh, with hiring any worker, is this individual going to provide a value added to assist in the manufacture of the good that I hope to sell to the consumers that will be greater or less than the price I think I could earn from doing so. And if in his view, the value added to this process the worker provides is, 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 is less than the wage that the government says he has to pay, he's not gonna pay him. The same right. way is that I might buy that suit of clothes for $100, but if the price tag says $200, I'm gonna pass on it. 
this yeah. worker can be very productive and he'd help me produce enough that it'd be worth paying him maybe $12 an hour. Yeah. But if the government says you can't hire him for less than $15 an hour, I may very well say pass and let and not hire him. Or if the government then imposes or raises the wage, I may let certain workers go who no longer are as valuable as what the government has mandated. Now, what is the consequence of this? Some people are going to lose their jobs if they're let go because at the minimum wage, they're no longer worth their hire. Or they may never get the job to begin with. Now, now, if someone has dropped out of high school, doesn't have any work skills, how do they get their foot on the first rung of the ladder of success, of better living and training and experience and workplace knowledge, if they can't get their foot on the first rung of the ladder? Because the minimum wage makes it unprofitable for them to be hired to begin with. You're, 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 you're leaving a segment of the population out of the cold and maybe permanently unemployed out of the best of intentions. The same thing has happened with rent controls. Oh, there are people who cannot afford, quote, decent or, or needed housing. Oh, rents are too high. Let's set a maximum on how high a landlord can charge to rent an apartment, for instance. But the problem is, is that that destroys the incentives for, 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 for potential uh, uh, home builders to build more apartments, more condominiums. Yes. There's no motive or incentive to do so. And you then basically create a scarcity. Uh, I can give an example of, of this from my, my own. When I was in graduate, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was uh, at first living in New York City. I'm a poor student. I have a scholarship, a stipend, and I can't afford a lot. So I'm looking for an apartment to rent in one of the boroughs of New York City. And I find a place that looked interesting, close to transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And th there was a sign on the, on the building that says, you know, apartments for rent. So I, so I knock on, on the door of, of the uh, manager of the apartment complex. And I say, I saw that sign. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I'd be interested in renting an apartment. And he said, well, we're all filled up. And there's not going to be one available for a while. And I said, well, is there a long waiting list? And he said, yeah, I think one would open. Let me put your name on the list. One should open up in about four years. Wow. Four years. <laughs> four years. Someone either either chooses to move out or they die. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and that's because all of these apartments are rent control. Right. So the price isn't rationing supply and demand. It's this artificial government regulation. Now, I should say that, you know, miracles never cease. Uh, I moved in to one of the apartments in this building a week later. I know you're thinking, what a lucky guy, serendipity. I also starved for a month and a half because I paid the superintendent of the building a bribe. So that's just uh, an artificial black market price to have an go. apartment allocated to me. That sounds like the Soviet Union. <laughs> oh, yes, come on. Right. There are similarities there, come on. Right. Close similarities. Oh, my gosh. So these are well-intentioned policies that backfire. Yeah, and and you know that's really interesting because that that makes me think about socialized medicine because it's the same thing with hospital beds, right? Or you know, let's say in a long-term care home, if you need to go there, like you have these long, long, long waiting lines. And so let's look at that a little bit because people are saying another another thing that Zoomers or millennials as well might say the reason that they want socialism is because they want to pay off their student debt. They believe that there should be health care for all and that everybody should have access to it. But, you know, if you actually see the outcomes of those systems, they're very different. Yeah, look, look, there's two uh, dimensions to this. First of all, me how medical care for all, higher education for all. These should be free to anyone, but nothing is free. Are, are, the, are professors like myself teaching just out of the goodness of their heart? Do we not have rents to pay, mortgages to, to, to pay off, food to buy at the store? We're paid salaries. The doctors, the nurses, those who produce and supply the medical equipment that 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 ha are housed in hospitals for diagnosis or operations or treatments. Uh, all of this costs money. And where does the government get this money to either give it to some people, quote, for free or at a price less than what would be the market price for that person to get those services? It has to be other people have to be taxed. Yes. So nothing is free. 
Some people are providing the money through taxes that the government then spends to direct the real resources in the directions that will fulfill those people's desires for something for free. But it means other people have less. But Some that's okay because it's produce. the billionaires though, right? Like this is the argument. Well, it doesn't matter. Those billionaires, they have all of the money without realizing that, no, this ends up falling upon the, you know, middle income earner or, you know, somebody who's an average earner will be more and more taxed because eventually there's there's not enough money to go to. Like, do you want to maybe get into that a little bit? Like, what does it actually look like? Well, for, first of all, uh, if, if you took all the, the billionaires in the United States and were to tax them 100 percent, you wouldn't even cover the government spending for half a year <laughs> in a I regular mean, year <laughs> yes you know, fair, but because let's face it well the, the government is, has been spending between four and six trillion dollars a year wow now the other thing about this is that the image is that these billionaires and millionaires are sitting at their home uh w w with a huge chest of gold coins and and, and rubies and emeralds <laughs> and playing with it, and, and the government can just tax this away. And as much as they tax away, amazingly, the, co the gold coins and the rubies and emeralds just reappear to be taxed <laughs> the next year. Well, first of all, if you tax them all, uh, the money is gone. Yeah. They're not billionaires anymore. So who do you tax next time? But, but more realistically than that, when you talk about a billionaire or a millionaire, that doesn't represent that someone has, oh, he, he, he's worth $10 billion so that in his checking account is sitting $10 billion in cash. No, it's tied up in, in businesses, enterprises, buildings, machinery, tools, equipment, the salaries that are going to pay workers. The fact is, if you tax that wealth away, you destroy the, the means by the financial and real means by which production continues at its existing and growing levels. So, in fact, you, you, you will impoverish the society in the name of giving away things for free. Right. Uh, so that uh, in, invariably, when any of these programs get up and running and, and then get enlarged year after year with more and more political promises, the, the revenues needed to pay for them move further and further down the tax brackets until basically the, the, the welfare state as we know it is paid for not off the backs of, you know, the, the, the billionaire who like, on you know, the Monopoly game imagery is a fat guy in a vest with a top hat and a cigar with his feet mm -hmm. up on the desk. Mm -hmm. It's you and me. It's yeah. you and me. The burden falls upon, upon us. And mm -hmm. by taxing us away, you destroy the financial and real resource wherewithal to both maintain the levels of production and more importantly to see that they continue to grow the, so that our standards of living continue to increase year after year. We are the lucky beneficiaries of all the wealth that was left in private hands which was then invested time after time in profitable ways that has enriched all of us. So if I was a young socialist I would probably hear all that and then part of me would start to disconnect from it because it's a rational argument that that shows you what it would actually look like. And then I would probably just fall into despair because I think that the real crux of the problem, or at least one of them, is that if you talk to a young person nowadays, they do not see a future for themselves. They do not know where they can go. And especially now you look at these ongoing lockdowns for two years and mm. the impact on their education and and thinking like, I have no life ahead of me, you know, and we see these increases in depression, in suicides among youth, they have no hope for the future. And so I believe that that's, that's a big part of it. And so then, you know, there's looking for magical solutions, I think, becomes very seductive at that time. Unfortunately, historically, you're very, you're right. If, if, if you, if you ask the question, uh, why did Germany go Nazi during the Great Depression? You know, historians would give a lot of explanations, okay? You know, the, the, the world is never single causal. I mean, all these different factors are always at work. 
But but let me suggest that 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 one that was important is the very thing that you were saying. The depression sets in for a variety of reasons that I would argue argue was caused by and then exacerbated by government interventions and controls and other things, both in the United States, first under Hoover and then under Roosevelt, and then before Hitler came to power in Germany. And you, you, you have a growing segment of the population who see no future for themselves, who are looking for an answer of someone to give them a job, to give them a future, uh, to overcome the humiliation of the defeat of World War I. Oh, someone will come along and make Germany, to use a phrase, great again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what he promises. And then public works uh, create jobs in Germany. That's the Autobahn system. They're inter what we call a high interstate highway system, their version of that, the Autobahn system. That was a Hitler's public works project. Of course, he was doing it for the same reason that ours is built, for military purposes. But that's a different yes. matter. Huh. Uh, and, and this idea that, 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 that I have no future for myself and I need someone to come along, some movement, some party, some leader, who will assure me a future and a, and a, and a place of a better, better life for myself. And uh, th that is one of the greatest dangers of these types of, 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 of economic cataclysms or economic frustrations. But I do want to emphasize one thing in this context, since you raised it, the, the current environment. Yes, uh, 2020 saw uh, uh, about a half, close to half a year of, of complete or uh, fairly severe lockdowns and shutdowns. And then they were only released slowly. Well, who is responsible for this? It was the government. It was the government who, not, not to some extent, the federal government, but especially the state governments yeah. to different degrees and, 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 and intensity. But the state government, the market did not shut down the society. Private yes. businesses did not shut down the society. It was not private employers who told their workers to put the, stop producing, go home, don't leave your house, only go out for pharmaceuticals or, 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 or food essentials, and we'll define what those mean and when and how you can do your shopping for them. No, it was the state and the federal government who did this in various and sundry ways. Yes. And now this, this difficult and, 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 and slow recovery, uh, production being restored, employment being restored, through which the, this, the American society, of course, it's a global phenomenon, uh, has gone through this long process of restoring these things for, over the last year is due to the fact, not because of a failure of capitalism, but that the government basically saying, thou shalt not work, thou shalt not shop, thou shalt not leave your house. And then making it extremely difficult through continuing regulations and controls and, and, and restrictions can uh, claim to be about you know fighting the coronavirus in, in enabling the economy and the society to fully more rapidly uh, uh, restore itself. Uh, right. Who? Right. What, what, one more thing about this. You know, yeah. the, the children, right? Everyone said, oh, it's for the children, right? The, the, the next generation. Uh, whose schools were shut down? The public schools. Who have refused to go back in the classroom? The government employed teachers and their unions. Yes. This isn't free enterprise or free markets. Predominantly, people go to government owned and managed and, 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 and finance schools. This is not a failure of the market. It's the failure of more government control over various facets of a life, including the educational system, looking at the whole process. So yes. again, people are, are being frustrated and concerned and, 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 and looking for answers. But unfortunately, the, we run the risk of them looking for answers and directions that would make uh, the difficulties of the moment far worse in the future. Right. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing from this as well is that there's this inclusive green recovery, which is basically a massive central planning effort to, to reshape the society around, around certain ideals, right? That they expect everybody to go along with. And, and that is kind of going along the socialist program. So we've seen interventionism galore. And now it seems to be that this is kind of um, perhaps desensitize people to being used to having that much um, um, intervention in their yes, in their it, daily it, life. It creates a sense of 
this becomes the new normal. Yeah. Which is a major problem that this becomes the, the new normal. Um, yes. But it need not be viewed as the new normal. Uh, if, if people are awake enough and become informed enough about the, the, the correct and right directions for economic policy reform and change uh, to improve our circumstance in, in, in the future. Um, it, nothing is inevitable unless people allow it to become inevitable. And uh, two years seems like a long time, but in the flow of events, it's not. And all of us have memories of a time when we shopped when we wanted, uh, worked how we wanted, uh, went, visited friends and, and went to entertainment and sport events how and when we wanted. And uh, uh, that could be all restored uh, in ways that would meet the concerns that everyone has of not getting sick, but without yes. the government's heavy handedness of attempting to control and direct and command everything. Because the, the, this has been the villain in the story, and it's yes. the government and not the market. So I'll just uh, finish with one last question. I thank you very much for your time. So what do you think one person can do? What is the, what is the thing that an individual can do to get there? Okay. Each, each, well, <laughs> there's several layers to this. One is, is that um, our time is pulled in many directions, work, family, friends, uh, interests of various and sundry sorts. But each of us must realize that the burden of the world falls on our shoulders. And we must be able to allocate and find the time to become more and better informed citizens. Uh, what has caused these problems? How have they come about? What would be a dead end direction to go further? And what avenue would lead us to a freer, more prosperous society looking to the future? Then the other thing is, is that um, you know, we are in a time when there's a lot of social and political and personal tensions, the polariz political polarizations that we see in the society. And uh, if one understands the value and importance of uh, individual liberty, uh, the value and importance and efficacy of a free market economy, uh, the, the, the long run uh, institutional importance of constitutionally limited government, et cetera, uh, one has to not be afraid uh, to speak up and as best as one can make the argument to defend and attempt to persuade others uh, that this is the path uh, that, that, that should be followed rather than the one we have. Um, uh, otherwise, th th you know, th there's a famous Austrian economist named Ludwig von Mises, yeah. And he once wrote an essay called Trends Can Change. People often feel, you know, fatally, oh, the, we're going down a trend. We can't escape from it. You know, it's inevitable. And it's not inevitable because trends, as he says in this article, have changed before and invariably they will change again. What it requires is knowledge and courage to, to learn what is right and, and then to speak it and defend it uh, so as to see that the trend moves in a better direction and away from the one that would lead further down the road of disaster. Excellent. There was also a, a great band named Led Zeppelin who said, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, you, there's still time to change the road you're on. Absolutely. <laughs> there's always exits. Well, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you and thank you for your insights on this matter. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank any viewer or listener who takes the time to share the conversation. Yes, and you could read uh, Richard's ex extensive pieces on socialism and all kinds of other topics at AIER.org. Oh, and if I may allow to toot my own horn. You can, yeah. And a pub book published by AIER <laughs> for a new liberalism uh, available on Amazon at a, at a very reasonable prices, either a soft cover or an ebook. So feel free. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Richard, and you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>